Uh, thank you, Bernd. Uh, dear colleagues, I would like to say um, a few words and to, to share a few uh, considerations uh, with you about um, topic one, biomass resources. Um, I will um, base this, uh, these considerations on, uh, on elements uh, from, uh, coming from you during this week. Of course, I apologize if uh, I'm not a faithful uh, translator, if I didn't get your messages uh, right. But since we are in Milan, traduttore, traditore. Eh? So uh, our colleague from uh, Canada, because we are not always sleeping, eh? sometimes we pay attention to the presentations, uh, including the one from Canada, made a, a reference to a publication from uh, Greenpeace with the title Fueling uh, Biomass. And uh, really, uh, the input on topic one, it was not on fueling a biomass, but it was on using three main biomass feedstock categories for three main uses in transport, heat, and electricity. And uh, this is what I call the, the biomass uh, mosaic. So we had many presentations, for example, on sugarcane, corn, soya, rapeseed, but also cassava, yatropha, sinara, rice, coffee, kenaf, pasture. Uh, in the case of uh, wood and the short rotation forestry or short rotation coppice, we heard about solid biomass, about eucalyptus, poplar, willow, uh, boreal forest, but also uh, Mary from uh, Australia. And we heard also much about uh, miscanthus, switchgrass, giant reed, and much also about waste or agricultural residues, cereal straw for, uh, for Europe, cattle residues, but also leaf tree prunings, Bagas, and even what I think was very new about uh, straw from sugarcane. We heard also about algae. Of course, as we all know, there is no magic crop but a con combination of uh, options depending on uh, agroecological zones and uh, other factors. Many of these crops are not cultivated for energy purposes, or only for energy purposes. And we got many presentations reporting on agronomic research that has been ongoing. And this is not my boss. But, um... So these presentations on uh, agronomic uh, research and field uh, trials, uh, sometimes we have more than 20 years of uh, field uh, trials about which there are reports. Uh, this is very important, for example, to better understand management practices, to progress about genotype selection, also to progress about the carbon measurement, uh, carbon balance measurements, that are so important to address some uh, uncertainties and to discuss uh, carbon payback time. Also, uh, many presentations about uh, mechanization. Mechanization, of course, is very important for us in Europe in order to push down biomass costs. But I think uh, this issue of pushing down biomass costs, it's valid uh, everywhere. So we had presentations, for example, on the cost of uh, production, harvest, transport, logistics. Something that I find new for this uh, uh, topic of biomass resources, taking as an example the sweet sorghum case, is the fact that for this crop we have now much more operational uh, data coming from uh, various projects or various uh, sources. 
Another thing that I think has been uh, new for this uh, conference, this came mainly from the event on um, biofuels for aviation. We now have a, a much more practical and realistic view about uh, feedstock uh, requirements and use. For example, camelina, waste oil, yatrofa for uh, aviation. And uh, this was related to, uh, for example, to the experience of Airbus company and not only uh, Airbus. We had many presentations about uh, the use of uh, GIS and uh, remote sensing for uh, resource assessment or land suitability assessment. An example is a biomass atlas of Italy prepared by, by Enea. Other contributions from uh, France, uh, Mexico, Germany, Argentina, uh, presentations at regional level. Some uh, presentation about a joint methodological development uh, with agriculture and forestry uh, specialists. And I think that uh, what comes, came out from uh, these presentations is that we have a much greater maturity in biomass resource assessment and we have much more elements to discuss uh, the potentials at uh, if it's natural potential, theoretical, technical, sustainable, economic, or um, whatever. But even for the natural capital assessment, this is still, this is a complex issue. And we, had, we got, for example, the example of the impact of large-scale insect damage in Canada and the consequence on the natural capital. We, we need to continue to work on terminology to make sure that we use uh, the same uh, words to speak about the same uh, things. We had also this example from uh, primary forest with, uh, with Canada. And uh, generally, part of the explanation of the differences in uh, estimates are related to different yield assumptions. In any case, I really think we have now a better understanding of ranges of figures on the assessment of biomass resource potential, and uh, we this is based on, uh, in my view, very useful uh, contributions uh, to this conference coming, for example, from Biomass uh, Energy Europe, from uh, Imperial College uh, study on global resource assessment, or the presentation from uh, this morning about the biomass future uh, work that was given by Mrs. Panuzzo. We also had a presentation of a critical review uh, of, of existing studies, including uh, IEA study. When you were not here, there has been some uh, criticism uh, from um, some IEA, not only IEA, but IPCC, and I must say all existing studies that was presented by the International Center on Transportation from uh, Washington. And, uh, uh, they apply the correction factor to the availability figures going to lower figures, uh, mainly due to different yield uh, assumptions. What I think has been new also in relation, for example, to last year, many more studies comparing uh, biomass potentials but with renewable energy action plans based on different methodologies. And uh, there, uh, there has been a link, for example, with other initiatives of a strategy definition and implementation, for example, in Lebanon or in Japan at the local level or, or in West Africa. The issue of uh, GMO and feedstock has uh, not been uh, discussed in detail but it has been uh, raised and there has been a proposal 
uh, to have no um, GMO used in the future for bioenergy. I'm sure that uh, this, uh, such a proposal will lead to a very intense uh, discussion and, uh, and why not uh, disagreement. But certainly there is, a, there is an issue on, about uh, GMO and uh, bioenergy. I think also for uh, this topic one, it's, it has been very clear that uh, there is more and more not only interest, but uh, work and studies about integrated use or about what we call cascading use and about integration with use of agricultural residues. And um, I think that was uh, very interesting to have, uh, for example, a presentation from Brazil with uh, an estimate of 120 million tons of sugar cane straw available by 2020 with the phasing out of burning. Yes, I did say 120 million tons, which is more than most estimates of cereal straw for all, country, all member states in the European Union. I think also uh, what came out, more realistic experience on feedstock requirements from, um, for biorefineries, for example, with bio, uh, Euro BioRef uh, project uh, presentations. And we had a session on algae that I think is considered as promising by many speakers, but still high cost need to scale up, issue of uh, realistic potential calculation and theoretical maximum yield, and also issue of economic models with co-products. The a point uh, that was um, uh, raised was also the prioritization of uh, uses uh, of uh, products coming from algae. We had also uh, the Italian Biomass Day with a, a strong attendance. And uh, um, for example, in, uh, in Italy in 2009, 28% of total primary energy from renewables was covered by uh, bioenergy. And um, eating and cooking we cover, should cover in 2020 54, so a little bit more than half of uh, renewable energy heating and cooking. And uh, I want to conclude this uh, few words about topic one by making a reference to uh, the, par the, the workshop on uh, biomass in uh, Sweden that took place. Of course, uh, Sweden is a leading country in environmental management, in local sustainability, and decarbonization of the economy. Uh, I think uh, that's a very uh, convincing uh, example about uh, the possibility to decouple uh, GNP and emissions. And uh, they have a target of 50% of renewable in 2020, according to their uh, national energy plan. And uh, of course, much, much of this uh, is expected to, to come from, uh, from forestry uh, for bioenergy. And uh, I think with this, I would like to, to conclude the topic one. So, oh, thank you very much. Next topic will be presented from David Baxter. We get the new slide, the proper slides up, okay. Um, okay. 
Okay, we now jump on to uh, topic two. Uh, in fact, I've uh, taken topics, I'm doing to topics two, three, and four. And because topic four is uh, going towards uh, industrial demonstration, that fits rather nicely in uh, with uh, topics two and three uh, in that uh, in many cases there are plants, there are processes, there are technologies that are rather close to, uh, to a demonstration and in some cases to commercialization. So I've slotted in uh, to this uh, topics two and three where there are points for uh, industrialization. So uh, there's rather a lot to get through, so I'll pick out uh, some of the main highlights. In regards to uh, large-scale combustion systems, we had a, a very, very nice uh, presentation here, I think, I, I think yesterday morning, in, uh, in the plenary on uh, all the detailed work done on uh, uh, biomass uh, combustion co-firing. Now, uh, co-firing is a very nice process because uh, you're very often using existing plants, so existing processes, existing technologies, but there are, of course, challenges. So it is the fast way in for, bio, uh, for bioenergy. Uh, and it also enables you to go to fairly high conversion efficiencies. If you're looking at supercritical steam, for instance, power generation, you're looking at 42, 43, 44, 45 percent. Uh, I think the, just before the, the break in the presentation this morning, efficiency, conversion efficiency was brought up as a key issue. So there is quite an incentive to go towards, uh, uh, to use this uh, co-firing. Um, as also mentioned earlier in the plenary this morning, it was noted that uh, there is some tendencies to go towards 100% uh, fairly large scale biomass firing. But there is a cost penalty, cost penalty in terms of uh, conversion efficiency, and that is a challenge for people here and in the, and in, in the industry, because you immediately drop from 42, 44% down to 30, 32%, something around there. So we have to think as a community, how best to approach uh, these sort of problems, or these sort of challenges, I should say. Um, pellet is a key uh, fuel for this, white pellet in particular, so the clean pellet without uh, uh, possible contamination. So there is a, a need to look at, uh, uh, at uh, additional uh, pellet sources. Um, on a small scale, uh, Stirling engines have been used, and there's a, a fairly successful, uh, small, very small scale supermarket in UK. But you've got to be fairly small uh, using Stirling engines. But the point here is, is that uh, uh, is very close to commercial viability today. I'm not saying anything about the conversion efficiency, but it's commercial, almost commercially viable today. There is a warning: uh, large scale systems are covered by emissions uh, directive, in industrial emissions directive, that is 50 megawatt plus. We can ask ourselves the question, what is going to happen in the future? And the people in DG environment are already looking at what sort of legislation there could be for small scale systems. So there's a, there's a beware thing there. We move on to gasification, CHP, polygeneration and so. Uh, there's an enormous amount of uh, presentations being done here, and I really can't do justice to, to all of them. Just picked out just a few to highlight some of the issues. Uh, gasification is, uh, is good for power generation, slowly uh, emerging. Um, there's this uh, novel sim, uh, biosim, I should say, process that is emerging. There's hot gas filtration is developing quite nicely. There's promising six megawatt uh, scale, small scale demonstration uh, being done in Denmark by this, uh, on this Pioneer, Pioneer uh, process from Dong. Uh, they're looking towards a 50 megawatt to plant in 2015. Syngas is widely studied for many, many reasons because once you get your Syngas, you can play with your chemistry set and you can produce all sorts of things. Very, very nice process. Technology is uh, developing in that area, and we have uh, examples there. Gussing is the, the cinder, the nice, uh, the nice process which is sort of the reference point. In the area of, of pyrolysis, um, the work has been done. A lot of uh, promising results are coming out. What is the threshold now is actually go over into some sort of uh, uh, use. And the 
the chairman of, the, of one of the sessions yesterday was telling me all we need now is something that's just going to take us over that little threshold. It does not have to be a very high technology application. It has to be something which just gets going into the market to start creating a market. And that is often the threshold between uh, research and uh, development and the real world. Anaerobic bi digestion, biogas production, has been a big uh, topic in this, uh, in this conference with uh, side workshops as well. Um, we've been told that uh, anaerobic, anaerobic digestion can address so many different issues, waste management, groundwater protection, renewable energy production, nutrient recycling, it indeed does all of those things. Often uh, the, the, one of the challenges is uh, to use the, the heat that is produced. We had one uh, interesting presentation on, on organic Rankine cycle units uh, that could s s come to the aid of, of, of some, of this, uh, uh, some of these problems. Looking forward, because anaerobic digestion is relatively, uh, relatively mature, but there are steps to go into the future, uh, Charles Banks gave a very nice presentation a couple of days ago on uh, uh, the research challenges and where we could be going in regards to uh, research. Now, biorefineries, bio you can probably uh, include biorefineries in almost everything that is done. It's just a matter of what is your def definition of biorefineries. Now, we've had a lot of uh, input from IEA Bioenergy, IEA in general, but in particular, Bioenergy Task 42 has provided us with a, uh, uh, a definition. Agree with it, don't agree with it. It, it. it is there, at least, and it's a nice reference. Now, there are lots of uh, processes that are, that are being uh, developed that are going on, one relatively uh, uh, close to hand here uh, in Italy. Um, but going back, going back to, to Canada, whatever time of the day it may be in Canada, Canada is very, very active on uh, biorefineries and uh, various uh, production. Often, uh, as in the case of uh, uh, the next uh, bullet point there, you'll see in uh, combination with uh, pulp and paper. Um, solid biofuels, um, we jump on to uh, now. Uh, I've said before white pellet production is, uh, is, uh, has increased uh, a lot. There is spot market in Rotterdam. Everything is going very, very nice, but the next step needs to be also to look at uh, pellet from other sources, of course. Um, there is, uh, despite the fact that it's very commercial, there are ships going around the world with millions of tons on board, there are really some careful safety considerations to be taken into account and there's lack of uh, standardization in this area and that is something that really needs to be addressed uh, in the future. Uh, advanced uh, solid biofuels, so we're talking here about uh, liquid, uh, rather torrefaction and, uh, and uh, various other processes that are making the likes of biocoal. We've heard quite a lot about torrefaction and I understand that uh, the, uh, the sessions were rather well attended. So there's a lot of interest in there because it provides this possibility of going from the, um, uh, the, the taking the uh, tackling this reduced efficiency conversion efficiency by making biomass into uh, an equivalent to something close to coal, which you can grind easily, you can handle easily, you can transport easily, you can store it. So th th there's there's real beauty in that process. And uh, the technologies so far have got to the stage where there are demonstrations ongoing, although there are, there are challenges in actually keeping the plant going for long periods of time. Um, opposite to that, uh, for, for the relatively dry forms of biomass, you can uh, look at the, uh, the, the wet forms of biomass and hydrothermal process <coughs> is uh, being worked on in a number of areas. And sewage sludge is rather a, a, a popular form of, uh, of biomass for wet processes, and there's quite a lot of competition for it. And the nice example given from the company Terranova, they are scaling up a facility where they are making a, uh, a form of uh, bio coal uh, in sort of uh, big plates that can easily be transported. Uh, Oil-based biofuels, um, then uh, there are all sorts of uh, work going on, in particular for, uh, for aviation biofuels. Uh, but uh, if you cast your mind back to early in the conference, uh, there was a very challenging uh, presentation by Les Eady from uh, Australia. And I must say that uh, if you get an Australian to speak, you can often get a message straight between the eyes. <laughs> direct. Really, really direct. Anyway, the challenging thing from here, after looking at all the different things, uh, all different processes, and the... Uh, 
projects around the world. Uh, Les said that the, maybe one of the best uses for algae is for feeding fish. <laughs> Do we agree with it? Do we not agree with it? Well, okay, we got the message, there's a challenge. So people thinking about algae, working on algae, please go back and uh, come back next year and tell us something more positive on the bioenergy biofuels side. If you're prepared to do that, we'll get Les back as well to challenge you again. Uh, biomethane. Biomethane is something which uh, you get from biogas or from even uh, converting that to uh, nice syngas. Uh, gussing again comes up as one of the processes that has been uh, uh, carried out a trial which I think was reported in a conference or one or two conferences ago. Um, this is a dedicated workshop by uh, Fraunhofer and uh, our uh, chairman's uh, colleague uh, which dealt with uh, that in very great detail. Um, biomethane is a very fast growing sector at least in Europe. Technologies are there, but some of the challenges are actually feeding into the grid, and there are some technical challenges as, as well as uh, uh, legal challenges. <coughs> One of the interesting areas coming out, uh, which is really expanding, is the use of liquid, and that is liquid uh, biomethane, uh, because it fits very well into the emerging liquefied natural gas market, which is growing because of our imports into Europe from uh, uh, various places around the world and those uh, very large tankers. The other interesting thing which uh, comes up uh, with a number of technologies, but in, in this particular case here, this example here, is being able to integrate bioenergy biomethane into energy grids which are being increasingly in influenced by solar and by wind, so the intermittent producers of electricity and other forms of energy in some cases. So how do you address that sir? as this uh, intermittency? It's part of nature. It will not go away. Uh, we have to live with it and have to deal with it. And biomethane is one of those, air, one of those uh, uh, fuels that can, uh, can be used in this respect by using the grid, for instance, as part storage. And there are other uh, parts in there, other uh, challenge, or rather other opportunities in there to, uh, to, to deal with that. Um, <clears throat> with regard to bioethanol production, there's a lot of work going on in uh, lignus allulosic uh, uh, biomass in the pretreatments. Um, and there is uh, one I'd like to, uh, one project I'd like to uh, uh, report on, and that is the major progress made in the last few years on, on uh, pretreatments with enzymes. And yesterday we heard a, a very nice presentation from Novozymes. Okay, you can say Novozymes is a commercial company. They wanted to give us a positive message. Of course, that is, is natural. But we have to have uh, uh, involvement of, of uh, industry in this conference to really calibrate our, uh, our ideas. But they expect to have a, a commercial reality, reach commercial reality in 2030, and they're actually be, uh, building the plant. <clears throat> Equally, uh, going back to the forest sector, um, <clears throat> there is the production of bio DME, Dimethylitha, and a very nice project which has been sponsored uh, partly by European Commission in the north of Sweden, where they've producing, been producing that for the last three, three and a half years, and operating trucks and uh, accumulated 600,000 kilometers of operation on that. So that's not just laboratory, of course. That has gone a few steps beyond. Now, a, a couple of special things I'd like to add in, uh, which were more on the, 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 the side workshops. But uh, one of, the, one of the, the, the drivers, maybe not drivers, or some that are pulled to the, to the, the area of uh, bioenergy, biofuels, is this um, aviation uh, biofuels initiative, the biofuels flight path initiative, which has been reported on in the side workshop. One of the really important things really here is that uh, you're making a biofuel, you're making a beautiful biofuel in the lab, in the pilot plant, in the demonstration, but eventually it has to, be, it has to meet a standard, otherwise somebody will not use it. The industry will not use it. In the particular case of uh, aviation, of course, the, the, the requirements are very, very strict. So the engine makers, the airlines will want to stick to the standards very, very strictly. And they have been able to achieve uh, uh, compatibility with uh, an ASTM standard for uh, kerosene, and that has been uh, used very much. <clears throat> On a separate uh, matter for biomethane, there's a, a standards committee being set up in, in Europe, NTC Technical Committee 408, and which started its work on injection and uh, vehicle fuel. 
There is an ob observation. This is from the technology side, because cost, of course, is a, a big matter. An increasing cost, uh, in increasing competition for biomass will increase as sectors uh, develop. There will be competition for the biomass. A lot of the time in the, in the last uh, 10 years or so, um, in particular for, for biomass residues even, there has been, 10 years ago, there was probably a gate fee. A few years ago, uh, fairly recently, the, the, the cost was, uh, was zero, but uh, the plant was paying for the transport. As we go into the future, all of these technologies, or very many of these technologies, will face the prospect of paying. The anaerobic digestion sector in Denmark is already paying for waste. So it's an inevitability, but that cost and that uh, technical consideration has to be taken into account in any realistic project. The problem is, is how do you predict it? I don't know. Um, so that's, that's, I think that's where I, where I close. Just one, one other message from the technology sector came from one of the chairmen before Jean-Francois goes back to look at uh, topic five. And that is that uh, the technologies are developing very, very nicely. In many cases, there are some very, very promising results. Um, the, the appeal to topic five people is that don't get too excited with LCA models and uh, all sorts of modeling and using poor quality data and kill the bioenergy sector before it can get off the ground. Please be careful with uh, the treatment of data and particularly on the reporting of the results. Thank you very much. So I would like to to report about uh, topic five, which is uh, the last um, topic um, of this uh, of this conference, and uh, which is about uh, biomass policies, markets, and sustainability. A few days uh, a few days before this uh, this conference, there has been. A, a report uh, from uh, BP with uh, statistics about uh, 2001, uh, 2011 year, and uh, apparently the global biofuels production stagnated in 2011, rising by 0.7 percent, and uh, uh, this is a weakest annual growth uh, since uh, 2000. So, uh, also, we have the situation of an uh, economic crisis and sometimes uh, questioning of uh, any kind of uh, public uh, support, but also for, uh, for renewables. Nevertheless, uh, in the European Union, we have our, um, our targets for 2020 that are often uh, mentioned. And, uh, uh, we are not, uh, we don't only have uh, targets, but also uh, programs to implement these targets. And there were, uh, for <coughs> example, many presentations about how to achieve these targets with uh, renewable energy uh, action plans. We heard this morning about the development in, on the pellet uh, planet. So EU, European Union, is still the main market. EU production increased by 20% in 2010, and it corresponds to 60%, 61% of the global production. And between, EU, between 2008 and 2010, EU consumption increased by 43%, and this corresponds to about 85% of the global wood pellet uh, consumption. I think there was a consensus about uh, the fact that half of renewable energy in the EU is biomass related and uh, on the fact that this will continue in the future 
even with the growth of other renewable energy uh, sectors. I think also um, in some um, discussions uh, it was clear that uh, some of the speakers had different uh, policy drivers or were referring to different policy drivers. So of course climate change is often uh, mentioned as a, a reason to have uh, bioenergy policies, but I think also uh, it was clear that there are other policy drivers such as uh, rural development or uh, competitiveness of uh, industry or uh, innovation policies. A question that is uh, often raised is, uh, that has been often raised is, do we have enough biomass? And uh, the message that I think was uh, sent uh, during this conference is yes, but, or yes, if. Ex there has been sometimes expression of a concern about possible impact of bioenergy in tropical countries. There has been an uh, introduction of a uh, presentation of a uh, difference of uh, concept between state policy and personal policy, and uh, this uh, refers mainly to our diet and uh, our meat consumption, and I think there was a consensus about the fact that uh, different diet or increase of cattle density has very significant implications in terms of land availability for bioenergy. In any case, uh, I think uh, for most uh, speakers, uh, it was clear that agriculture is a 4F, food, feed, fiber, fuel. There were some references to the coming, to the growing sector of biomaterials and green chemistry, but not many contributions on, uh, on, on this uh, topic. Issue of competition of uses was also raised about forest for uh, pulp and paper or panel industry. And sometimes this is uh, considered as an opportunity Sometimes it's considered uh, as a problem. And of course, biorefineries can uh, contribute on this. Uh, for the European Union, uh, we have a, a biomass potential. I think this was uh, presented this morning. Um, but uh, there were uh, sometimes some uh, points raised about how do the farmers convert annual crops into short rotation forestry or short rotation uh, copies if there are no uh, long term commitment or clear rule of the game after uh, 10 years. So there, there is an issue for the greening of the common agricultural uh, policy. I think there was a consensus about also about the fact that uh, there is a need to increase uh, biomass uh, mobilization, but we, we didn't, uh, I think, have many uh, detailed input about uh, precise mechanisms to make this uh, happen. I think also uh, the, about the topic of uh, cr possible crop yield uh, increase in the EU, it's retained as, uh, as reserve limited, much uh, larger possibilities of crop yield increase, of course, in, uh, in Africa, but uh, some question marks about where do the investments in agriculture modernization will come from. From the World Bank and FAO, there has been a, a clear message addressed about the fact that the bioenergy sustainability must be addressed on a case-by-case -case scenario on a country uh, level and depending on crops, depending on local conditions and agricultural markets. 
so no general uh, statement. Um, I think also there was a consensus uh, from the participants about the fact that environmental impact, it's not only greenhouse gases emissions, it's also uh, biodiversity and water footprint assessment. But um, we didn't have many presentations on, uh, on biodiversity and uh, water footprint. There was a contribution on biodiversity from, uh, from CTB Brazil. I think what's new now is that uh, uh, there, are, there were many um, that we can uh, refer to existing sustainability schemes for biofuels or bioenergy. I think there was only one colleague who, who stated that uh, these uh, certification schemes are uh, useless because uh, in his view this would lead only <coughs> to leakage or to displacement. Uh, but I think for most participants this is uh, retained as a, a very uh, positive uh, development. Uh, project from Netherlands about uh, certification systems and Africa. Uh, some um, discussions or presentations or input about uh, possible future certification schemes for solid uh, biomass. And uh, some people uh, about policy stressed the need of policy coherence between bioenergy and biomaterials. We had reports on, uh, of course, on uh, the progress in uh, standardization. This was mentioned this morning. And of course, uh, some, uh, some discussion about uh, indirect land use change. That's a very, um, very complex uh, and sensitive issue. I would say that on, uh, on one side, uh, there are uh, radical uh, people who would like to stop all bioenergy development due to IHOOC. On the other hand, there are also some people who consider that uh, we should not consider uh, land use change only for bioenergy if we don't consider it for other uses. In any case, we had many technical contributions uh, or several co technical contributions, including the one from this morning that I think will help us to address this issue uh, technically. We had also a link through some participants with the uh, European Industrial Bioenergy Initiative. And regarding international cooperation, uh, presentation from uh, cooperation between European Union and China in the field of biogas, with uh, an estimate in 2030 of uh, a very large po biogas potential in China. That was estimated at 20 times the one of uh, Germany. And also a CEA presentation uh, from the Europe-China Clean Energy Center with a quantitative study of the biomass resource in, uh, in China. And uh, I will not uh, repeat, uh, you, you heard uh, the presentation of, uh, of Mr. Frankel from uh, International Energy Agency about uh, IEA technology uh, roadmap on uh, bioenergy for heat and power. So I don't need to repeat anything, but I, I wish to stress that this document uh, with the one produced last year by IEA on biofuels and also uh, in my view with IPCC report on bioenergy is uh, essential for uh, the future, uh, not only discussions, but uh, implementation of uh, bioenergy in the future. And I'm sure this will be a reference uh, document 
that uh, to which we will be confronted uh, very often in the future. And uh, after this, uh, this part of uh, advertisement, I would like to, to conclude uh, this part on topic five.